Now, let's talk about the Hartree-Fock equations. Um, if I minimize that energy that I've been talking about for a while now, and minimize it with respect to the orbitals, the spin orbitals, I get a set of equations. And I'm not going to derive these because it takes too long, but they do this in the Zawa and Oslin book, so I encourage you to take a look at that. You get this um, kind of complicated looking equation um, where the one electron operator acts on a spin orbital chi i, and you get this equation for all possible chi i's. Um, plus this kind of complicated thing, I've got a thing in brackets, I'm summing over all the other spin orbitals chi j, and um, this thing is basically uh, absolute value squared just means the function times its complex conjugate. So that's the probability of finding electron 2 at location x2 if it's in orbital chi j. And if it were there, it would have a Coulomb repulsion with an electron in orbital i of this. So there's the Coulomb operator there. So this is kind of a Coulomb term. That's kind of one electron term. And then this is the exchange term where I've um, basically taken this Coulomb term and swapped a couple indices. I moved an i inside, moved j outside, so here's chi j outside, here's chi i. So it's kind of a mathematical artifact, and it k terms get minus signs. And then on the right-hand side, uh, when I first do the derivation, I get a sum over all the other orbitals times some uh, Lagrange multipliers, epsilon ij um, times chi j of x1. Little complicated, but I can define a new operator that kind of lumps together a lot of this complexity. It'll be the one electron term, which is kinetic energy plus attraction of the nuclei. It'll be this thing, which is basically the Coulomb repulsion that an electron feels due to all the other spin orbitals j, um, uh, chi j. Uh, and this thing, which I'll call k an exchange operator, and I'll call this the Fock operator after Vladimir Fock, who co-invented the Hartree-Fock procedure. And if I write it this way and then do a little more magic here that I'm going to gloss over, um, I get F acting on chi i gives epsilon i times chi i. That's just an eigenvalue equation. So this is very interesting. It means if I want the best spin orbitals that give me the lowest energy for my Slater determinant, they are the ones that diagonalize the Fock operator or that satisfy this eigenvalue equation. So the chi i's, the best ones, are the ones that are eigenfunctions of the Fock operator. And their eigenvalues are these things, which I'm going to interpret as an orbital energy. So this equation hopefully looks simple to you and uh, we can solve it. At the moment, it is a bit of a complicated equation because f hides inside of a bunch of integrals and some stuff, and h has a second derivative operator in it because it's got kinetic energy, but at least writing it this way, you know, uh, looks simple, and in fact, we kind of can turn it into something uh, simple-ish. Okay, but at the moment, it's a complicated integral differential equation, integrals and derivatives through h. So really, the person I rely on to do this, or that we all rely on, is Clemens Roton, who says, introduce a basis set. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, I'm not going to have infinite freedom to vary these chi's. I'm going to write them as a linear combination of some basis functions. And I'll pull the tilde on the basis functions. And these are pre-selected functions that somebody has said, you know, these functions are really great. Use these and I use this collection of functions, there's a finite number of them, and I insert these into my eigenvalue equation here. And when I do that with a couple lines, that's not super hard to prove, I get this equation um, using these same C coefficients here. Each chi i gets its own linear expansion, so I need two coefficients on front of the C coefficients. Um, so that's these C's are those C's. Uh, this F is related to that F. I need to show you how. And uh, these C's are, again, those same uh, C's. And the epsilons are the orbital energies. And what are these S and F terms? Well, they're not super complicated. 
this is an overlap matrix of the basis functions with themselves. So this tells you how much does basis function uh, nu overlap with basis function mu. So it's an integral, I have to do an integral, but I can do that and get this. This is a so-called matrix element for the operator f that we've been talking about. And I just sandwich this operator in between two basis functions, basis function mu and basis function nu. And again, I would go off and grind out how to do this integral or let my computer do it. And if I have these matrix elements and these matrix elements, then I pop them into this equation. And this is a linear algebra equation very well suited to a computer. And you could rewrite it if you want. This is kind of in matrix element notation. But if you stare at this for a couple minutes, you can see that this is the same as this matrix equation where I do all the possible uh, equations simultaneously in the big matrix. So this has two indices and it really can be written as a matrix. This has two indices, it can be written as a matrix. Likewise, likewise. Epsilon I could write as a diagonal matrix here. So it's this um, matrix equation which almost looks like an eigenvalue equation. So if I had operator F or matrix F, you could imagine that my solutions are different columns of this matrix C and corresponding to different elements down the diagonal of this matrix epsilon. And the only reason it's not an eigenvalue equation is there's this S thing that's kind of in the way. If I didn't have S, it would be F C equals C epsilon and that would be a classic eigenvalue equation in linear algebra notation. Because of S, it's a pseudo eigenvalue equation. I have to jump through a few hoops to take care of S, but there are ways to do that. Okay, so I get a pseudo eigenvalue equation. I'm basically trying to find the eigenvalues epsilon and the eigenvectors that go into the vectors of the C matrix, um, and those are my solutions. Now, if I have C, then that tells me what my orbitals are, because remember that or each orbital chi i was just a linear combination of these basis functions, and the C matrix gives me that linear combination. So that solves for my orbitals, essentially, C, and then the epsilon gives me the orbital energies. Uh, so I think I just said that each column of C is a molecular orbital, and each element of that column tells me what fraction of each basis function goes into that orbital. Okay. Only one problem with this. Well, there's a little problem with what to do with S. I'm going to gloss over that a bit. The other problem is C depends on F, and F, unfortunately, depends on C. Why is that? Well, F had this J and K operator in it, and J and K, you might remember, had a sum over all the other spin orbitals, chi J, and how do I know those? Well, I don't until I get C that tells me what orbital chi, each orbital chi is in terms of the basis functions. Um, so I need the orbitals to form F, but the orbitals come from diagonalizing this equation. And so uh, F needs C to form it, but uh, I need F to solve for C. So what do I do? Uh, it's like a chicken and egg problem. I use a self-consistent field procedure, uh, which is easy to say. Um, first, the user has to say, what molecule am I interested in? What are the coordinates of all the atoms? Because remember, the atoms are frozen in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, the nuclei are anyway. Um, and then the user also has to tell me what electronic state am I going for? Am I going for a singlet or a triplet or doublet? We need to talk about spin at some other opportunity. And then the user also has to specify what are these basis functions, the chi tildes that I'm going to fix ahead of time. Then the computer is going to use those basis functions and compute this overlap matrix S using the equations I just had. It's going to guess some initial MO coefficient C. Those will give me the columns of that C matrix. Um, hopefully I can guess something good. There's a whole art to guessing these things. Then I'm going to form this Fock matrix, F, um, using those guess coefficients, C. Then I'm going to solve my pseudo eigenvalue equation. That's going to give me a new set of C matrices, and the columns are the different orbitals in terms of the basis functions. Then I use the new 
coefficient c to build a new Fock matrix, and then I diagonalize the Fock matrix again. So I'm going to loop uh, over uh, steps 4, 5, and 6 over and over and over again um, until I uh, find that my C matrix no longer changes. And then I'll say I'm converged and I will stop. And that's the self-consistent field procedure. How do I form this FOC matrix again? Um, well, it's defined as this one electron operator plus these J's and K's. Here I'm going to go ahead and for simplicity assume I have a closed shell molecule just because it's uh, quite easier to think about maybe. So I'm going to sum over the number of electrons divided by two because each spatial orbital will get two electrons in it. Um, and for each spatial orbital that an electron sees, it's going to see two electrons in there. So that's why there's a two. Each one is going to give me a J term, a Coulomb term. This guy out here is going to be repelled by both the electrons in orbital I, spin or, uh, spatial orbital I. This electron, though, is only going to feel a, a stabilizing exchange integral with one of these two because um, only same spin interactions can survive. So if this guy's an alpha spin, he'll have a K term with the alpha spin, but not the beta spin. And similarly, if this guy's a beta spin, he'll see the beta spin for a stabilizing K term, but we'll ignore the alpha spin. So whatever the spin of this orbital is that I'm trying to solve for, it'll interact uh, through the K term with exactly one of the two electrons in spatial orbital I. So that's why it's a minus one times K for a closed shell. And doing a little math, I wind up being able to show that the matrix elements of this, if I put um, a, uh, a basis function on the left and the right of this expression, mu and nu, then this turns into f mu nu, this turns into h mu nu, this turns into mu nu i i, this turns into mu i i nu, it rearranges indices, that's why it's called a exchange integral, um, and then each spatial orbital i is a linear combination of basis functions, with C coefficients, and I can insert that into where I see I's here. By the way, in quantum chemistry, when you see an index repeated twice and you're inserting a sum, you have to insert the sum twice. There are, this orbital phi I is here twice, and if phi I is a sum, then I insert the sum twice. So there's a sum that goes in here, and another sum that goes in here, and then likewise there and there. And that's why I've got a sum over lambda and sigma here. I use different dummy indices um, because I inserted the sum twice. Once here, once here, and then again. Once here, and another time here. Um, so I'm glossing over some steps uh, in the interest of time, but all I did was insert phi i there and there, and there and there, and I got this expression. And then I said this guy, C lambda I times C sigma I, I'm gonna call a density matrix, and um, I'm gonna sum over I to form that density matrix. So this sum goes away, this symbol turns into this symbol, and this is a classic expression for how to form the FOT matrix elements in a basis uh, of uh, basis functions, I'm name numbering like uh, mu and nu. It's a one electron operator, that uh, matrix element that I evaluate, and it's these two electron integrals using the same definitions we've talked about before, but now these are in terms of the spatial um, uh, integral uh, of the basis functions, and um, now you see the indices are not the same in terms of basis functions and I multiply them by this density matrix, which is related to the C's. So if you were coding up how to form the FOT matrix, you would code up this thing. You'd need to be able to compute one electron integrals, two electron integrals in terms of basis functions, and then you would uh, multiply by this D matrix. Um, this is the rate determining step of Hartree-Fock theory, is um, computing these uh, two electron integrals, and then multiplying them by D to form the FOT matrix. 
normally this computation of these two electron integrals can be rate determining unless you are very very clever about it and then take some precautions in which case you might shift the cost somewhere else but in a naive implementation this is very costly to compute why well because i have to compute uh, one of these two electron integrals for all the possible combinations of the basis functions and so suppose i had um, 100 basis functions well then i uh, have 100 basis functions that could i could pick out mu from and then 100 that i could pick out nu from and 100 i could pick out lambda from and 100 i could pick out sigma from so the number of these without truncation is uh, something like 100 to the fourth which is awful lot so it, in general it's into the fourth if n's a number of basis functions so that's a problem um, if i'm a little cleverer i can uh, discover that the integral depends on the overlap between basis function mu and basis function nu so they need to be close to each other spatially and then likewise lambda and sigma have to be close to each other so if taking that into account um, then um, it reduces to something more like order n squared significant two electron integrals um, but um, even then that can be kind of a lot and i have to be careful with my screening um, there are fancier, more elaborate ways to reduce the cost of this. Linear scaling techniques using fast multipole methods and whatnot can ultimately make the cost of Hertree-Fock more like linear in the number of basis functions. Uh, not all programs implement this, but it's a trick that can be done and can uh, certainly help if you're going to big, big molecules. Um, if you're in a size regime where you're not going to giant, giant molecules, uh, there are alternative techniques that can be very fast. One of them is called density fitting, where you say these, these four index two electron integrals are very tedious to compute and deal with. Even if you compute them, if you don't use them immediately, you've got to store them on disk or in memory, and there's too many to do that. Uh, so they're really a pain. You can instead reformulate in terms of some three index quantities, and uh, that's what density fitting does, and that can be very, very convenient. Okay, suppose you do all this stuff. What do you get out of it? Uh, well, you get the electronic energy because um, that's a that's a, a product of Hartree-Fock. You get that electronic energy, um, which is only valid for that particular set of nuclear coordinates. So if you want a potential surface, you've got to redo the Hartree-Fock at different bond stretches or bond angles or whatever is appropriate for your problem. But in principle, you could do that if there's not too many coordinates. That can give you a potential energy surface. Um, even if you don't explicitly map the full 3 and minus 6 dimensional potential surface, you can walk around on it by going down in the gradient direction to optimize the geometry of a molecule. And you can get reaction paths in various things. You get the electronic wave function, that's that Slater determinant. Now we know what the orbitals are that make that up. And from that Slater determinant, we can get dipole moment, polarizability, other properties. Um, you get orbitals out. Those are the columns of that Slater determinant. Sometimes people like to analyze orbitals to get insight into what is the bonding doing and where's the density of the molecule and that kind of thing. Um, and you also get orbital energies, which can be helpful as well. What are the orbital energies? Well, um, each occupied orbital does have an energy associated with it. Um, and that uh, energy is typically negative, meaning that an electron would like to be in that orbital. If it were positive, that's a sign that an electron actually would prefer not to be in that orbital and to fly off into space or something instead. Um, so as an approximation, it turns out um, that the negative of an orbital energy for an occupied orbital is approximately the energy required to remove an electron from that orbital. Uh, that's the Koopmans theorem. You also, as a byproduct of Hartree-Fock, get some orbitals, molecular orbitals, that are not occupied. Uh, you might say, well, why do I need those? The Slater determinant only has the occupied orbitals. Yes, but if you um, say have 10 electrons, you need 10 occupied spin orbitals. If it's closed shell, maybe five occupied um, spatial orbitals. 
uh, but uh, the columns of, this, of the Slater determinant are all the spin orbitals. So let's say 10 electrons fills 10 spin orbitals in your Slater determinant. So you have 10 occupied spin orbitals. Um, but if I used a basis set that maybe gave me 20 basis functions, then I'll have 10 functions that are left over to describe unoccupied states. Um, do these unoccupied states have any physical meaning? Um, yeah, they would describe where an electron might want to go if I add an electron to the system. And the orbital energies of those then give you approximately the energy it would take to put an electron in that orbital. But this is a very rough and ready approximation that is not particularly accurate. Um, let me mention this, it's very important. You might think that if I took all the energies of all those occupied spin orbitals and added them up, that would give me the energy of the system. Not so. It turns out that it's not true that the sum of the orbital energies equals the Hartree-Fock energy. You wind up kind of double counting some of the two electron terms and they simply don't add up that way. Let me say something about the energy units. Um, the atomic unit of energy is called a Hartree. Sometimes people call it AU or sometimes E sub H. And the hydrogen atom in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation um, is defined to have uh, energy of minus one half Hartree, okay? So that defines uh, the atomic unit of energy. And a Hartree is a gigantic unit. It's um, 627.509 kilocalories per mole. And you might know that to break uh, like a carbon-hydrogen bond takes, uh, what, I don't know, like around 100 kilocalories per mole. So this is a big, big unit on a chemical scale. Um, just a, a quick example of what some orbital energies look like. Um, here is an example for a copper uh, plus ion, what some of the orbital energies look like. So the 1s is very low in energy. Um, as you get to heavier and heavier elements, your 1s orbital gets more and more and more stabilized. So here the Hartree-Fock energy is, um, I guess, minus because it's occupied 658.4 Hartrees. And you remember a Hartree is 627 kilocalories. So this is uh, gigantically stabilizing. Put in, putting that first electron in a copper plus uh, ion is uh, very, very energetically stabilizing. And experimentally, what would you get if you ripped an electron out of that orbital by uh, you know, hitting it with a laser or something and popping out a 1s orbital uh, electron? It's a 661.4. So um, it's not a perfect agreement. Uh, on a relative scale, the percent error is pretty low, so you're in the right ballpark. It's not bad. On an absolute scale, you're off by, what is that? Like uh, something like three Hartrees, which is three times 627 kilocalories per mole. So absolute scale, you're off by gigantic amounts of energy. Relatively, you're about right. And then 2s is um, not nearly as stabilizing as 1s. So there's a giant gap there. This typically happens in heavier elements. There's a big energy gap between 1s and 2s and so on and so forth. So it's only 82 um, Hartrees in Hartree-Fock, and then the 2p is at 71. And experimentally, again, you sort of see sort of reasonable agreement, not a perfect agreement. Okay. Um, Practically speaking, let me wrap up just by saying a little bit about what does it take when you run a Hartree-Fock calculation as a user? Well, um, the self-consistent field procedure normally works pretty well as long as you have a reasonable guess. And most quantum chemistry programs will give you a reasonable guess as long as you're not doing something super complicated or weird. Like, uh, well, you might say, well, why don't I break a bond? That's not weird. Bonds break in chemistry all the time. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, the Hartree-Fock can have a hard time getting a good guess for that, and the self-consistent procedure can have a hard time tracking that. So, um, so maybe some not so unusual situations can be hard. So stretch bonds, di radicals, transition metals that have partially filled D or F shells can confuse a program. High spin states in general. So if you have a triplet state with a couple unpaired electrons. You might think, well, those kind of happen sort of commonly in chemistry. Is that a big deal? 
Sadly, yes, for most quantum chemistry programs, there's not a bulletproof way to always converge those. So you have to watch out sometimes. Um, if you have a really high symmetry molecule, like an octahedral situation, like SF6 or whatever, um, sometimes if the program goes off on the wrong foot and um, thinks that you occupy certain molecular orbitals that have certain symmetries that wind up being wrong, it's very hard to break out of that because different irreducible representations don't uh, talk to each other in a Hartree-Fock procedure. So if you put an electron in a, you know, an EG orbital and it was really supposed to go in a T1G orbital, they, they can't mix because they're orthogonal by symmetry. So um, occasionally high symmetry molecules can be a little tricky. A lot of programs have some way to realize they've gone off in the wrong direction and try to correct, but the, the higher the symmetry, the less likely they are to figure this out. Um, and by the way, just turning off the symmetry of the calculation uh, doesn't solve anything. Uh, a lot of students somehow think that is a genius idea, but um, if you understand something about uh, how the guess uh, system works, if the guess system generates orbitals, and if those guess orbitals have symmetry, then it doesn't matter if you turn the symmetry on or off, it's too late. There's an underlying mathematical symmetry that the program may or may not be using, but it's there whether you like it or not. And, uh, and, and so uh, that symmetry will propagate whether you have it turned on or turned off. It's actually there in the calculation, um, irrespective of what the user wishes. Okay. Um, are you guaranteed to land on a minimum in most programs? Uh, no. <laughs> You might land on a saddle point uh, or uh, a, a transition state like a uh, point in orbital coefficient space where maybe you're at a minimum with respect to these C coefficients in some dimensions, but in some dimension you're at a maximum with respect to variations on C. Um, you can check for this if you run what's called a Hartree-Fox stability analysis uh, and uh, that will check the second derivative of the energy with respect to orbital rotations or variations in C. And if you're not at a minimum, you'll find out. You'll get a, a imaginary roots for that and uh, that will be, or negative roots for that, and uh, that will be helpful. And then you could follow one of those modes downhill and try to escape uh, from that saddle point. Um, if you're in some high symmetry case where you've landed like in a local minimum in C space, then this um, trick of looking at a Hartree-Fox stability analysis won't solve it for you, unfortunately, because you're in a local minimum and you don't realize there's a global minimum down here. Um, the user needs to come up with uh, good orbital occupation guesses um, for, by, by picking the correct spin state. So if you're trying to solve for a triplet state, you need to make sure you have a guess that's a triplet state. Um, for example, you know, if you don't know any chemistry, you might think that the O2 molecule uh, is, has all its electrons paired uh, and it's a singlet, and that's what programs will guess by default. But in fact, the O2 molecule is a triplet state, and the programs aren't smart enough to know that. Uh, and so they'll guess that it's a singlet because they think everything's a singlet, if there's an even number of electrons, and then it'll be wrong, and it'll give you a wrong answer, and you won't know it. Um, so the user is responsible for knowing what, what is, what's the spin state that I'm trying to solve for. If you have a nice, well-behaved normal molecule, a lot of them are closed shell singlets, and so that is a good guess, uh, but uh, it won't save you if you encounter a molecule like O2 where the, the user is the one that has to know that's a triplet, because the program doesn't. Okay, and um, Finally, I'll just say a couple words about improving the convergence of the self-consistent field, uh, field procedure if you have problems. A lot of programs use something called uh, direct inversion of the iterative subspace. That's D-I-I-S. That's already done for you, so that's not something a user really needs to do, but I mention it because it's very, very helpful to these programs. This was created by Peter Poulet. Um, but what the user can do is try to make sure that they have a good density matrix guess, that initial C matrix that you need in the Hartree-Fock procedure. There are lots of different procedures for doing this. Programs sometimes have a menu of possible ones and they'll default to one, but it's not always the best one necessarily. 
Um, if you have an option called Core Hamiltonian, that's normally not advised anymore in modern programs. It's usually pretty poor. It'll get you by if you have a small molecule, but it's not generally a good idea. A Huckel guess or a GWH guess is, is okay uh, frequently. Um, superposition of atomic densities is usually a very good idea if your program can do that. Um, there you just guess a density that is what the density would be if all the atoms were separate and didn't see each other. And obviously that's not what the real molecule will do, but that puts you in the ballpark uh, frequently, and that's not a bad idea. If you're having trouble with convergence, one of the things to try is just tell the program to try a different one of the guesses it has in its menu and see if you get lucky. That's a little trial and error, but it's quick to try frequently as long as it's not a giant molecule. Um, if you had a, a calculation converge at a different geometry, and if that geometry is nearby the geometry you're at, maybe your program allows you to project uh, previous molecular orbitals onto a new geometry. And if it does, that can be a very good guess. Um, similarly, if I had a closed shell molecule and I converge that just fine, and then I'm trying to study the cation and I'm having trouble converging that, well, maybe go ahead and feed in the neutral molecule orbitals as a guess for the cation because they won't change uh, gigantically compared to the neutral, and those will probably be a very, very good guess. Um, so I would advise that. Or likewise, if you have a closed shell molecule and then you're about to add an electron to go to a doublet anion, again, the closed shell orbitals are easy to get, and they might be a good guess uh, then for the anion. Okay, that is our intro to Hartree-Fock theory. Um, we've scratched uh, below the surface and seen some of the equations, uh, and then we've also talked about a few practical matters. So I hope that's helpful in giving you a, a much better understanding for what Hartree-Fock really is, and a little bit about how it works, and what some of the ingredients to it are, and some of the computational cost and, and considerations.